So chapter four is on the premolars. So the, now we're moving to posterior teeth, incisors and canines, anterior teeth, premolars and molars, posterior teeth. So there are eight premolars in your mouth. Starting on the upper right, the universal numbers are four and five, 12 and 13, 20 and 21, and 28 and 29 in each quadrant, upper right, upper left, lower left, lower right. You have first premolars and you have second premolars. First premolars are the ones more anterior. The second premolars are the ones closer to the molars. They take the place or replace the lost primary molars. So remember, primary dentition does not have premolars. Their function is for chewing. They maintain vertical dimension of the face. In other words, they keep the cheeks out. They assist the canines to shear or cut food. And they support the cheeks and the corners of the mouth. So um, they are the teeth that are often at times extracted for orthodontic purposes. They do less and less of that. Back in my day when we were younger, they almost always took canines out because they are not canines, I'm sorry, premolars out because they waited for all the teeth to come in before they started looking at orthodontic treatment. And now they intervene at a lot earlier of an age and they do palatal ex expansion and things like that to allow more space for those teeth to come in as you're growing rather than waiting until all the teeth came in all jumbled up and then going, well, now what are we going to do? So they are much better about orthodontic. They also found that from an aesthetic purpose, purpose um, taking out premolars flattens out the smile. It doesn't give you that big round um, wide arch like you ideally want. Most premolars have two cusps a buccal and a lingual, but the mandibular second premolars may have three cusps, one buccal and two lingual. So every one of these rules that we have is going to have an exception. And so what I want you to do when you're studying, or when you're taking notes or looking at pictures or what, it, however you're going to be studying this stuff, look for the exceptions. Because each one of them has an exception, and so you can rule out by looking at the exceptions for quiz um, and test purposes, just like I said with all the other teeth, I will never flip them upside down. If it's a mandibular, the root's going to be pointing down. If it's a maxillary, the root's going to be pointing up. Now you're going to have more choices because there's a first premolar and a second premolar and there's a right and a left on each arch, but you can automatically rule, start to rule it out just by whether it's a maxillary or a mandibular. And then you're going to apply the exception rules and you're going to rule out the ones that it's not. Does that make sense? So premolars develop from three facial lobes just like the anterior teeth, but each um, cusp, lingual cusp, contains a lobe. So if you're talking about a two cusp premolar, you're going to have three facial lobes and one for that lingual cusp. If you are talking about a mandibular second premolar that has two lingual cusps, it's going to have three facial lobes and two lingual lobes. So it'll have five lobes. So three of the, the premolars are going to only have four lobes. The mandibular second premolar is going to either have four or five. So I always tell, I know you guys are starting to work in each other's mouths now. So what I want you to do when you're in your clinical time next, starting next week, is start looking at the teeth. Look at the premolars, look at the shapes of the premolars. That is going to benefit you every bit as much as the lab time that we have. If I get a chance, if I can, I'll pop in and I'll kind of try to show you guys some of this stuff but I don't, I don't always have the chance to. So, um, but do look at these. I'll let your clinic faculty know that you're supposed to be looking for these things so that when you're in clinic, you can actually see real teeth because there's a lot of variations in anatomy. 
Some of you will have two cusps and some of you will have th uh, three cusps on your premolar, second premolars. So let's look at these teeth. The crowns taper toward the root, just like anterior teeth did. And there's some pictures of some anterior teeth and the crowns taper toward the roots. In other words, as you get closer to the CEJ, they get narrower and the roots taper apically, so they're kind of cone shaped. So as you get to the apex of the root, it gets narrower, just like an anterior tooth. All right, and so um, how do they differ from anterior teeth? They have um, a, they have occlusal tables, not incisal edges. So in other words, they have a big round chewing surface versus the incisal edges or the cutting surfaces of the anterior teeth. Those occlusal surfaces are going to contain a lot of grooves and things that we're going to look at and we're going to know their names because the grooves all have names. Um, the crowns are shorter than the anterior teeth, and so if you looked at a premolar next to a central incisor or a canine, the crown's going to be shorter. So in other words, from the cervical incisal view, meaning looking at it, how tall it is, it's going to be a shorter tooth. And the biggest difference here is the height of contour or the big place of the largest bulge on the facial and the lingual are going to be in two different spots. So remember on all your anterior teeth, the height of contour or where the tooth was the widest or biggest was right at the gum line or at the cervical third. But on premolars and molars, that's not the case. So on the premolars, the height of contour on the facial is still going to be up closer to the gum line or in the cervical third. But on the lingual, it's going to be in the middle. And so what that means for you and knowing this is if you notice right here, you've got your height of contour. It sticks out the farthest. I marked it with a black line. It dips in right there as you get to the gum line. So what that means for you is that's a nice little place for calculus to form because patients oftentimes brush, they use their brush pretty much straight like this. And so when they get to where the tooth bulges the most, they bring their brush like this. And so you can see with that kind of a movement, they're not getting that little bit right there. So when a patient opens their mouth, and you, particularly on the lingual, I mean on the lowers, when they open their mouth and you're going to start cleaning, you will often see rings of calculus in that little area along the gum line because they aren't angling their toothbrush at that nice 45 degree angle to brush the gum line. You have to get around that bulge to get to the gum line and they aren't. They're just going like this back and forth. And so that little area right there is never getting brushed. And so they'll have calculus there. The crown shape is a pentagon, very similar to the canine teeth. Um, and then here's where we start throwing in the exceptions. The contact areas are convex. So in other words, they bulge out and the distal contact is more cervical than the mesial, just like we talked about on your other teeth. If you look at, I marked the contact areas with these black lines. This is the mesial side, this is the distal. And you can tell, one of the ways you can tell is because this side's a little more rounded, the distal is. You'll notice that that rule about the roots curving toward the distal is not true anymore necessarily. So we can't just look at the root. We've got other rules though that apply to the root and we'll get to those, but for now. So the contact, as you go more distal, it goes up more toward the cervical. So here it's it's in the like occlusal third. Here it's moving up more toward the cervical. There is an exception though, your mandibular first premolar. Your mandibular first premolar, the contacts are the other way around. 
and I'll show you that when we look at those teeth. But for now, the um, distal contact is more toward the gum line or more cervical than the mesial. So right here is where it contacts with the canine. And then your mesial cusp ridge is shorter than your distal, except on the maxillary first premolar. So remember on the canines, the somebody's trying to get back in the meeting. So remember on the canines, we said that the mesial cusp ridge was shorter than the distal. So on the premolars, it's the same thing. The mesial cusp ridge is shorter than the distal, except on the maxillary first premolar. And I think I talked to you guys about that triangle of space that's between your canine and your first premolar that gives a kind of an aesthetic look. That's because the distal cusp ridge on the canine and the mesial cusp ridge on the first molar are your longer cusp ridges. And so it gives it a bigger kind of triangular look. And when you get a chance, go in the mirror, lift up your lip, wash your hands first, lift up your lip and look at your premolar and your canine. And you can see that nice little space. Unless you've had your first premolars extracted, then you won't see that. But look at your own teeth. And when you're in clinic, again, look at that little triangular space. Look at the cusp ridges and the incisal ridge on um, your canines. Crown outline narrows toward the lingual, so some proximal surfaces are visible from the lingual. This is kind of a hard concept to visualize, and I tried to find the best picture I could. But if you think of it as um, you've got something that's six inches wide right here, and you've got something that's four inches wide sitting in front of it, when you're looking from this way to this way, you're going to see these little sides sticking out. If you are standing in front of a pole that's wider than you and somebody's taking your picture, you're going to see little bits of the sides of the pole. That's the concept I'm trying to emphasize here. The facial surfaces are wider than the lingual surfaces. And so when you're looking from the lingual, you're going to see a little bit of that facial surface um, coming around. And they're calling it the proximal because it's going to be between your two teeth, but it wraps around. It's three dimensional. So the facial wraps around and here's the inner proximal surfaces and the lingual is narrower. So you're going to be able to see these two sides. Um, you can look in your textbook and see if you can visualize that and also look at your dental light app. So if you've got your phone handy, open up your dental light app. If you're looking at this on your phone, you probably can't, but open up your dental light app and look at the premolars and rotate them around. They are anatomically perfect. So when you're looking at the lingual, you will be able to see some of the sides here. And then they are wider facial lingually than they are mesial distally. So they are, in other words, deeper this way than they are this way. So when um, on a primary molar, a primary molar is the opposite. It's wider this way than it is this way. And so what happens is as you're losing your teeth, your primary teeth and your permanent teeth are replacing them, if any of you have children, been around children, seen children's teeth, um, whether it's in dental practices or whatever, their central incisors and their laterals when they come in are so big compared to what those tiny little baby teeth looked like. And so they kind of look like bunny rabbits when they first come in because they've got these huge central incisors. And then they've got the lower ones, same thing. They've got huge central incisors compared to the baby teeth, the primary teeth. So by the time you lose your four primary incisors and your four permanent incisors come in, they're pretty jumbled up most of the time. Although a lot of times now what they do is they take out the primary canines on the, on the lowers so that those incisors have enough space so they can come in nice and straight. But you pick up that space in two ways. One, the child's head grows 
as they get older because the premolars don't come in until they're about nine years old. So their head grows more between six and nine years of age. And the other thing is those primary molars are wider. So when they fall out and the premolars are slender and come in, then it gives room for the canines. So it's kind of all in a perfect world. It all happens in a perfect way. Now we all know that most of the time it doesn't happen perfectly and we end up with braces, but that's OK. And here's a picture. The bottom one on this slide shows you if you were looking down at the tooth from or up at the tooth from the um, occlusal table, you can see how this is wider. This is the facial side right here. This is the lingual side right here. And you can see how it's wider on the facial side and it tapers narrower toward the lingual. That's the shape of the crown of a um, premolar. It's wider at the facial and it tapers narrower toward the lingual. The incisors do that as well, but the incisors um, aren't as noticeable because they're a much narrower tooth. If you're measuring them from facial to lingual, they're not this wide. They're much smaller, about this wide. Does anybody have any questions about this? Because I know this is a lot of kind of abstract that you have to look at. Anybody? And again, I think I used this example earlier on, but if you think of like a, a racetrack, it's got to be wider on the outer um, tracks. Lane six is always wider. Lane one would be like in here. So as you're coming in, it's getting more narrow. Your occlusal table is bound by marginal and cusp ridges. So when you are looking at an anterior tooth, whether it's an incisor or a canine, we said the marginal ridges come off the cingulum and run to the incisal edge. So they kind of form the mesial and distal borders on the lingual. And we saw that on the plastic teeth and we saw it in pictures. So hopefully by now you're comfortable with that idea. On a premolar and a molar, because they have a wide occlusal, you have marginal ridges and cusp ridges that meet. So your marginal ridges are still on your mesial and distal, but they're on the flat occlusal surface. They're not on the lingual surfaces, they're on the occlusal surfaces. And then you still have your cusp ridges, which come off the cusp tips. So you have cusp ridges right here, <clears throat> excuse me, and right here, and then you have your marginal ridges that fill in the sides. So in other words, your cusp ridges are going to be on your coming off your cusps on the buccal and the lingual. Your marginal ridges are interproximals. Your proximal contacts are located to the buccal. So from the buccal lingual midline, what I was showing you here is if you see this black line right here, that would be if we were to slice the tooth in half, buccal on one side, lingual on the other. We slice the tooth in half. You can see your contacts or your widest, your crest of curvature, your height of contour is closer to the buccal surface. You see those red lines? It's closer to the buccal surface. And so what that does is it makes your embrasure spaces larger. Now we all remember what embrasure spaces are. Somebody tell me what the embrasure spaces are. Be bold, come on. Somebody get tell me. Anybody? All right, we're all going to be quiet this morning. So your embrasure spaces are these spacious spaces between your teeth. So you have embrasure spaces that are along the gum line that are filled with your interdental papilla, but you also have embrasure spaces that surround the, the occlusal and incisal surfaces. So right here is what we call an embrasure space. Your canine would be sitting right here. They would contact right here at this red mark. 
and then your canine would round down like this, and this is your embrasure space. So you can see that this right here is also an embrasure space, but see how tiny that embrasure space is compared to how big this one is? So when you're in clinic, I want you to look at the lingual, um, the occlusal surfaces from the lingual, and you'll see there's so much more embrasure space. That becomes important to you because when you're using those scalers, which I know you started using yesterday, when you are using those scalers, you're going to be able to access the contact right here better from the lingual because there's more space to slide your instrument in because it's wider. And so it's a lot easier to take your Cavitron tip when you start using Cavitrons too and slide your Cavitron tip right here because Right underneath those contacts is that area called the call, and I know you're familiar with that term, and that area called the call is where patients often get calculus buildup. And they get it there because they're not flossing their teeth or water picking, but that's, a, that's an area you have to be able to reach with those instruments. And when you start using your scalers, um, like you did yesterday, it's really fun, but your scalers are brand new and your tissue's really tight. So your scalers are really wide and that tissue is really tight. So it's really hard at this point for you to get those scalers all the way into the call because the, they're so wide and your tissue's so tight. Um, you didn't start your Gracie's yet though, I don't think. So um, the Gracie's are really wide and it's really difficult to reach that area. Now, most of your patients are gonna have some inflammation in their gums and that'll make it easier. But for you guys, when you practice on each other, most of you don't have any inflammation or very little. This is what the occlusal surface of a premolar looks like. Now we go, we're going to get into more exceptions. The buccal and the lingual triangular ridges join to form a transverse ridge. So we talked about this in chapter one. Here's a premolar, maxillary premolar. You've got your triangular ridge coming off your buccal cusp to the center, which is what a triangular ridge does. It comes from the cusp tip to the center. You've got your lingual, which comes from the cusp tip to the center. They meet in the center and that whole ridge is called the um, transverse ridge. Now on a three cusped lower premolar, this is our exception. You've got your mandibular premolar, second premolar that has three cusps, one on the buccal and two on the lingual. The buccal one is the red one, the two on the lingual are the blue ones. Notice they don't, they don't form a straight line anywhere. They don't meet anywhere. So they do not have a transverse ridge because they don't meet anywhere. And there's a groove that extends from the mesial fossa to the distal fossa. So the groove extends, here's the mesial fossa, here's the distal fossa. And this groove extends across, that's called the central groove. On this one, you've got the mesial fossa, you've got the distal fossa, and you've got this groove right down the middle, the central groove. So the, the transverse ridge is where the triangular ridges cross the central groove right here. I'm sure you guys have to have questions by now. So anybody want to ask a question? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. okay. I just, I just so, so embrasure spaces, are they the same thing as interproximal spaces? Like, do they, is that a interchangeable word or is there a difference? No, it is pretty interchangeable. Um, embrasure spaces are just kind of a, like a generic term for the spaces around the teeth. When you're looking at embrasure spaces, usually like in clinic and your clinic faculty mentions embrasure spaces, um, we're usually talking about the spaces where um, where the gum tissue comes down, the interdental papilla comes down. 
I think earlier on we looked at pictures or a picture. If you took the interdental papilla off, or if a patient has perio and they've lost the interdental papilla, that triangular space is called an embrasure space. Okay. The occlusal and incisal, those are also embrasure spaces. Same thing, they form a, like a triangular space. We just usually aren't necessarily talking about them as much because most of our work is hygienist is going to be on the gum line. But when we are trying to access our instruments, the embrasure spaces are bigger on the lingual. And a lot of times I've found when I'm scaling that it's easier to get all the way in and approximately if you go from the lingual. I know as a new hygienist and an, a new clinician, it seems like intuitive that you'd want to go from the facial surface or the facial view or the buccal view because that's the one that's easy to see. You retract with your mirror, you're looking with your eyes and you can scrape that. But you have almost better access if you come from the lingual. And once you get past term three or four, probably term four, um, it gets easier to scale with indirect vision. It gets easier to position the patient so you can see the linguals and stuff like that. And what, so once you get the hang of that, most of the time that's when you start to notice, I can access th this area better if I go from the lingual because there's more space. So it's kind of a concept that has to grow on you. But yes, you're right. They are in, they are the same. Okay. Anybody so, else? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. So when you, are you basically saying like it's, it's sub gingival? Like when you're taking a piece of floss and then you're going up underneath the gum line, or if you're taking a tool packing cord or anything like that, is that what you're getting at? Yes. I've almost always found it um, that you have better access from the lingual. Right. And yeah. as you're learning, like I said, your your um, intuition is telling you, I'm going to go from the facial because it's easier to see. Mm -hmm. it's smaller, it's easier to see. But, but I've always found... attached tighter to that tooth from the buckle. Yes, you've okay. got more space there. And when you get, you know, as you get your instruments worn down a little bit too, then it gets a little bit easier to do the buckle as well. But you're going to find, especially with your instruments being brand new, that that buckle space is pretty small and it's pretty hard to get a big fat instrument in there and that you can do it a little bit better from the lingual. Okay, got it, thank you. So your arch traits that differentiate the maxillary and mandibular premolars. So now we're gonna look at both. Your mandibular premolars have more noticeable lingual crown tilt. What does that mean? If you look at your own teeth and we talked about occlusion, when your teeth come down, you have what we call working cusps. Those are the cusps that are chewing your food. So your teeth are staggered in your mouth like bricks. So your upper teeth with their cusps, pretend these are the cusps, are coming down and the lower teeth cusp is coming into the center. That's how you can crush your food in there. They don't hit cusp to cusp. They hit inside the groove. So your lower teeth come inside your upper teeth. Some of you are familiar with the term crossbite. Anybody in dentistry familiar with that? Your teeth aren't crossbite? Yes. That's where the cusps don't do what they're supposed to do. And the lower ones are outside and the upper ones are inside. They're supposed to, upper teeth are supposed to come out a little bit over the lower. And if you've never noticed that before, Number one, look when you're in clinic at your partner before you start scaling their teeth, but also look at your own teeth in the mirror and just pull your cheek back and bite them together and you can see the upper ones stick out a little bit more toward the cheek than the lower. So on the upper, you're actually chewing with your lingual cusps more. Wait, no, I said that. Yeah, that's right. And on your lower, you're chewing with your buccal cusps more because they're coming in like this. So in order for that to happen, your lower teeth, your mandibular teeth tip in a little bit toward the lingual so that your maxillary teeth are coming straight down. Your mandibular teeth are tipped in a little bit to make that buccal cusp work. Um, you have typodonts. I know that. 
your typodonts are anatomically correct as far as their occlusion. So look at your typodonts too. If you have them handy, go grab it and look at how the teeth bite. So those cusps that are um, on the buckle on the lower that are chomping the food away are your working cusps. On the lingual, it's this inner cusp here that's keeping the food in and chomping it away. So you're naturally, your mandibular teeth tip in a little bit toward your tongue. And you may not have ever noticed that, but go when you're we're done with lecture, pull your cheeks out and look at your teeth. Open your mouth really wide, um, looking down in the mirror, and you can see the tilt in toward the lingual on your lower teeth. I don't know how well you can see it on a skull. They have it, but I don't think I can. you can see it very well, but maybe a little bit. Can you guys see that skull? So the mandibular teeth tilt in toward the lingual a little bit. Now, even the incisors do that. Well, they flare this way, but incisors sometimes will tilt to the lingual. And when they do that, they're really hard to scale because you can't see anything. But, and sometimes orthodontists have done that. They pull in the incisors because the jaw relationship is off and so they'll just tip the incisors in rather than trying to pull the jaw back. So you will have patients that have that. And then like I said, they're really hard to scale on the lingual because their linguals are tipped in and you can't get your instruments under their tongue and it's it's tricky. Um, so then your um, so that's the lingual tilt and a slightly more noticeable distal to tilt viewed from the facial. So they don't just tilt in like this, they tilt back toward the distal. And then your mandibular premolar has a buccal cusp that is much longer than the lingual cusp, less so for the maxillary. So if you look at these pictures right here, and you're looking at the lingual cusp, this is the lingual cusp, this is a lingual cusp, if you look at the mandibular, you can see that the buccal cusp is so much bigger than the lingual cusp. See how big that buccal cusp is compared to the lingual, where on the maxillary, they're almost close to the same. In fact, the maxillary second premolar, they are about the same length. The maxillary first, they're pretty close. But look at this mandibular first. The buccal cusp is way up here and the lingual cusp is way down here. And this is the cusp that you're chewing with on the mandibular mostly. Same with this one. And you can kind of see um, why that would be that those are bigger, stronger cusps. So this, we'll go back one to this once for a second. This mandibular first premolar is a very odd looking tooth. When you are looking in a patient's mouth and you're, say they've had premolar extractions, 99% of the time or more, the patient is not going to know which premolar they took out because they're now in their 50s and they had this done when they were 12. So they do not know which premolar was taken out. They'll remember that they had teeth taken out for ortho, but they won't remember which ones. And so you're going to have to decide which one it is. Unlike the incisors, it's harder to tell radiographically which one it is. So most of the time you have to tell clinically. If you see a tooth that looks like this, where the buccal cusp is way bigger than the lingual cusp and sits way higher, it's going to be a first premolar. If you see one that looks like this, where they're almost even, it's probably a second premolar. Most of the time they take out the first premolars, but you can't go by most of the time. Your doctor wants more accuracy than most of the time. So um, you're going to be doing your charting, your restorative charting and your perio charting before the doctor comes in and looks at the patient. And so you're going to have to determine this, especially on a new patient when you've never seen the patient before. So you're going to have to determine this before the doctor comes in. And so when we have these patients in clinic, 
will walk you through it at first, but by term seven, we expect that you can guess which premolar was extracted. Mandibular premolars may have more of a distal tilt of the crown relative to the root. So this is a picture of a picture perfect premolar. And you can see there's a little bit of distal crown tilt. So here's the um, cusp ridge is shorter on the mesial than the distal. And it tilts more to the distal. In other words, this curve right here is bigger than this curve right here. Can everybody see that? This has almost like a bend right here. And this is more straight. All premolars have buccal, lingual, greater than mesial, distal. In other words, they are deeper than they are wide. Deeper than they are wide. So if you measured them from the buccal to the lingual, your number would be bigger than from the mesial to the distal. And again, the primary molars are the other way around. They are wider than they are deep. And so when they fall out and the premolar comes in, there's going to be a little bit of extra space there. But that extra space is going to be filled in when the canine comes in. Because the canine, the permanent canine is bigger than the primary canine. So you pick up that little bit of extra space when they come in. I have a but for premolars, premolar they are deeper than they are wide. I have a question. Sure. Is that just for mandibular premolars that they are deeper than they are wide or is that for mandibular and maxillary? All premolars have All. a buccal lingual greater than the mesial distal. All premolars deeper than they are wide. OK, thank you. Let's take a little break. Does that sound like a good idea? Let's come back at 8.55. Everybody good with that? Yeah. Okay. Yep.
See, there you are on camera. See? Oh my goodness, so cute. This is Eloise. Oh my goodness, so, so cute. <laughs> if you're a dog person, Eloise is quite the, the social little creature, aren't you? So cute. My dogs are the same way. I have two miniature schnauzers and a Morky. Oh, I bet they're adorable. So that was the other thing when I um, when I was teaching the other cohort, Perio. As the term went on, kids were showing up in the camera. <laughs> dogs and cats were showing up in the camera. Everybody got kind of more relaxed about it. She's quite the little barker, though. That's why she gets kicked out most of the time when we're on our team's meetings, because she likes to bark, right? And you're going to sit here quietly, though, aren't you? OK, so let's go ahead and get started again. So back to the premolars. So um, the mandibular first premolar is closer to square. Oh, I'm sorry, I should start from the beginning. Mandibular premolars may have more of a distal tilt. Oh, I showed you that already. All premolars have a buccolingual greater than the mesial distal, but the mandibular premolar is closer to square. So the mandibular premolar is closer to square. So if you look at the, um, I'm sorry, the tables on the mandibular, see how they're more square? And these are a little bit more rectangular. Not a whole lot, but a little bit more. These are the three different types of occlusal surfaces you can have on a mandibular premolar. This is the mandibular first, and then these two are the mandibular seconds. So I think we talked about how you can have two cusps or three cusps on the lingual of a mandibular second, and these would be the two different ways they would look based on that thought. We're going to look at it much more closely in a few minutes here, though. Um, your maxillary first premolar is larger than your second. And your contacts are in the middle third. So if you look at these premolars, your contacts are going up as you're going more distally. The distal contacts are more cervical than the mesial for both of the maxillary premolars. So in other words, they contact lower down on the mesial, higher up on the distal. Um, the maxillary first premolar has a mesial cusp ridge that is longer than the distal. So we said on all the other ones, the mesial cusp ridge is shorter, just like the canines, except for the maxillary first that has the longer mesial cusp ridge. So this picture right here is your maxillary right first premolar. Does anyone want to take a guess at what tooth number that is? Maxillary right first premolar. Five? Yes, correct. It's tooth number five. So your maxillary right first premolar, the mesial cusp ridge and the distal cusp ridge, the mesial is actually a little bit longer. On your maxillary right second premolar, the mesial cusp ridge is shorter than the distal. Just like your canines and your would be on your um, that we learned on the, the other day. And then um, so that's unique to your maxillary first premolar. So when you're taking notes, write down your exceptions. So the maxillary first premolar has a mesial cusp ridge that is longer than the distal. And then the maxillary second premolar, the mesial cusp ridge is shorter than the distal with the cusp tip mesial to the midroot axis line. I'm going to show you that, but don't worry about that too much. I just want to show you what that looks like. This green line, these two green lines down the center of the teeth, 
are the mid root axis line. So if we were to just divide the root in half, right and left sides, on the maxillary first, the root or the cusp tip is more to the distal. On the maxillary second, it's more to the mesial. That's all we're kind of showing. Same thing like down here. If you look at this picture, you can see the distal cusp ridge and the mesial cusp ridge. And this is the tip of the cusp. OK, the cusp shape is more pointed on the maxillary first premolar than on the second. If you look at a maxillary first premolar, which you're going to do tonight when you look at your own teeth, it looks almost just like the canine on many people. Now, um, that would be anatomically, it would look like that. Now, not saying that you don't grind your teeth or clench your teeth and maybe you've rounded that cusp tip off a little bit, but it looks very much like a canine. And years ago, if people were missing um, their lateral incisors, which is common to genetically be missing your lateral incisors, so you never get permanent laterals, they used to slide the, the canine forward. They used to slide the first premolar forward because the first premolar looked almost just like a canine. And then they could reshape the canine or put a crown on it to look like the lateral. They don't do that anymore at all. Um, now what they would do is put an implant in where the lateral is missing. So the um, cusp is more pointed. The buccal ridge is more prominent on the maxillary first than the first premolar than the maxillary second. So if you look at right here is the buccal ridge, it's going to be in the cervical third, but it's more prominent on the first. The second premolar is flatter. One thing you'll really notice about this particular tooth we're going to talk about in just a minute here, but is it's got a bifurcated root. See how it's got the root splits? This one doesn't. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, but maxillary first premolar is more likely to have two roots, whereas the maxillary second premolar only has one. So here's the picture of the roots. This is a maxillary first maxillary second, and you can see how the root splits. Unlike your molars where the roots split like this, they split like this. So you'll have a buccal root and a lingual root. Rather than on a molar, you have a mesial root and a distal root. Here you're going to have a buccal and a lingual. And they don't always, they usually don't split all the way down. They only split toward the end, but you can see it on a radiograph. So why is that important to you? Because you've got root grooves right here that are pretty deep. And that root groove is deep all the way down. And then even on the crown, there's a, an indentation on the crown. And that allows for calculus to build up. These first premolars are very common teeth to get periodontal disease. Because it's hard, once you have some bone loss, it's hard to clean and the bone loss just goes fast because you've got all these grooves in here and it makes it really hard to clean. So when you're probing on a perio patient, you really make sure that you get all the way in to the right position to probe because maxillary first premolars on the mesial have deep root grooves that are prone to perio. The lingual cusps of the maxillary premolars are somewhat shorter than the buccal cusps more so on the first than on the second. So you can see if you're looking from a lingual view like we are, you can see more of the buccal cusp on this one than you can on this one. But either way, on both teeth, the lingual is shorter. So if you've got the cusp coming down like this on the buccal and this on the lingual, and you rotate it this way, you can see the buccal cusp from the lingual view. Just like in that picture, we're looking at a lingual view and you can see the buccal cusp. I always kind of envision it like if you have two people standing together, say you and your child, and you're standing in one position and your child's standing right in front of you. Your child is, is the lingual view, you are the buccal view. 
And if somebody's taking your picture, they're not only going to get a picture of your child, but they're going to get a picture of you because you're wider and you're taller. The distal marginal question. ridge. Oh, I'm sorry. Does somebody have a question? Yes. Is the maxillary first pre the only one that's a bifurcated root? Yes. So that is unique to the maxillary. For the premolar. What's that? For the for the premolars? Yes. So that's unique to the maxillary first premolar. It has a bifurcated root. None of the other premolars do. Okay. Thank you. Every once in a while, you'll see we had a, pa a patient in clinic a couple of months ago that had, when we first came back from COVID, that had both the maxillary premolars were bifurcated. So, of course, we had to look at it. Everybody had to see it because it was kind of unique. So, the distal marginal ridge is more cervical than the mesial marginal ridge. So, in other words, the... Um, I guess it's pretty self explained for both maxillary first and second premolars best seen by comparing the mesial and distal views. Maxillary first premolar, the lingual root is shorter and narrower than the buccal root, so this is consistent with the crown. Like I just illustrated, if you're taking the picture from the lingual view and your child is the lingual root, and you are the buccal root, you're going to see the buccal root from the lingual view, just like you would see you too along with your child. If you were taking the picture from behind, you would not see the child. So from the buccal, you would not see the lingual because it's smaller, it's going to hide behind it. But from the lingual, you can see both. The maxillary premolars have trapezoid outlines, so there's a trapezoid right here, and this is kind of what they look like if you were to put the trapezoid over the picture. Um, the maxillary first premolar is the only premolar to have a proximal crown depression, so that's what I had just talked about. You've got on the mesial, you've got this root groove that's kind of deep, and they illustrated that with a darker line and it goes all the way to the crown where you have a crown depression right here. So when those patients build up calculus down this entire side of the tooth, your instrument's gonna go in a little bit deeper right here because there's an actual depression right there where you don't have that on the others. Anytime when you're going back through the PowerPoint slides, anytime it says only, those are your exceptions. So it's the only one to have that. And then your uh, maxillary, uh, maxillary first premolars lingual cusp and lingual roots are usually shorter than the buccal, which we just talked about. The facial height of contour is in the cervical third. So all your teeth, the facial height of contour is in the cervical third, meaning it's up close to the gum line. The lingual height of contour is in the middle third. So this is what we talked about earlier. This is just to re-illustrate what we talked about earlier. So you're going to have your widest part of the tooth up here. And then as you get to the gum line, it dips in a little bit. And so that's where you've got to get your scalers, though, because that's where patients are missing with their, with their toothbrush. And for the longest time in clinic, probably until you get to maybe late term six or early term seven, you're going to just focus on trying to get calculus off. And so when we're doing your scale checks and we find calculus still on the mesial of tooth number five, we'll kind of remind you, remember there's deep root grooves, remember there's a deep indentation depression on the crown um, to kind of remind you of those different things as we see it happen. Your job, your goal at first is going to be just to be able to get the calculus off. And we know that. The marginal ridge groove is found most consistently on the mesial marginal ridge of the maxillary first premolar. So this is the mesial of the maxillary first premolar. You've got your bifurcated root. Okay. And you've got your lingual here, your buccal here. You've got that deep root groove, and this shows it really well. See how deep that root groove is? 
Now, normally the bone level is going to cover that up because your bone level is going to be right about here. But on a patient that's starting to get some bone loss and they lose down to about here, you can see it's in it indents right right away. You also have this depression on the crown right here, and you can kind of see that in the picture. So that you follow that deep root groove up and right there is an indentation on the crown. Then you've got this mesial marginal ridge. So it's a ridge that comes over the mesial side. It's a little um, indentation right here, common for caries. So when you're doing your um, shepherd's hook and you're looking for decay, that's a common place to get caries, is over here in this groove. It's unique to that premolar. So you've got several unique things. The maxillary first premolars have bifurcated roots. They have a deep mesial root groove. They have a deep depression on the crown, the mesial of the crown. And they also have a mesial marginal ridge groove. Those are four things that are unique to the maxillary first premolars. And as always, they have more CEJ on curve on the mesial than on the distal. And that's for both premolars. And I guess it would be all your premolars and anterior teeth. So remember on the canines and the incisors, we said the mesial CEJ curves more than the distal. So this mesial CEJ has more curve than the distal, just like on the incisors and canines. So incisors, canines, premolars, mesial curves more than the distal where the CEJ is. That's an easy way to identify whether you're looking at a mesial or a distal. For purposes of testing, I will always have it look pretty obvious. So you'll be able to tell the mesial and the distal and the CEJ will have definitely more curve on the mesial than the distal. The CEJ on the lingual is more occlusal than on the buccal. So the CEJ traces around the whole tooth and on the lingual it's more um, on the lingual is more occlusal than on the buccal. So you can see it dips down more here than it does here. More CEJ curve on the mesial than the distal on both first and second. We just said that and you can see it on this one, how it dips more here. This is more straight across. See how that one has almost like a little V in it. And then the CEJ on the lingual is more occlusal than on the buckle. So that just means that your CEJ going across the front and back of the tooth is more, um, it goes higher up on the, on the buckle. The maxillary first premolar is the only premolar with the mesial root depression. We talked about that. Your maxillary is the only premolar with a mesial crown depression. We talked about that. And the distal root depression is more pronounced on the maxillary second premolar. So think of opposites. Your maxillary first has the deeper root depression on the mesial. Your maxillary second has a deeper root depression on the distal. So you're going to go on opposite directions. So you've got two premolars. This one has a deeper one on the mesial. This one is deeper on the, the distal. The maxillary first premolar is likely to be slightly larger than the second. The length of the central groove of the maxillary first premolar from the mesial pit to the distal pit is longer than on the second. So what that means is if you're looking at the occlusal table, from the mesial pit to the distal pit, from there to there, the length of the central groove on the maxillary first is longer. So you've got a longer central groove. And then if you notice here, I drew a little purple line. That's that mesial marginal ridge groove. It's called the mesial marginal ridge groove because it crosses the mesial marginal ridge and goes onto the interproximal surface. None of the other grooves do that. So notice that little purple groove. 
Those maxillary premolars have a noticeably greater dimension facial lingually than mesio distally. So facial lingually, meaning going this way, they are noticeably bigger than they are this way. And you can see that definitely by the picture. They are much deeper than they are wide. And your maxillary first premolars have that mesial marginal ridge groove. So we've already talked about that. Maxillary first premolar outline is more asymmetrical. I wouldn't worry about that. And the mesial contacts are near the junction of the buccal and the middle thirds. So in other words, the mesial contact is right about if you were to divide this tooth into three sections, being the um, buccal, the middle, and the lingual, the mesial contact is more toward the middle. The distal contact on the maxillary first premolar is more buccal than the mesial. So it contacts more toward the mesial. I don't think I have any test questions about that part of the contact. So this slide right here with all this information on it, just kind of read this over and know it. It sort of repeats itself a few times in the PowerPoint just to show different illustrations, but I'm but don't worry about the mesial one and the distal one and where they're located exactly. The mandibular premolars vary in shape more than the maxillary, so the mandibular are a lot easier to tell the difference on. The mandibular second premolar is the only premolar more likely to have three cusps, so there's an exception. It's more likely to have three cusps. Second premolar. The only one that can have three cusps, actually. The mandibular first premolar is longer than the second premolar. And so if you look at this picture, the mandibular first premolar is longer. It's a big longer tooth. The buccal cusp of the mandibular first premolar is sharper than the second, just like on the maxillary. So see how sharp that one is? Resembles a canine. See how the, the ridge right here is short? compared to how it slopes down right here. So in the mouth, it looks similar to a canine when you're looking at the buckle. When you look at the occlusal, it looks a lot different. The CEJ is more curved on the mandibular first premolar than on the second, and the mandibular first premolar is the only premolar and only adult tooth. So this is a big exception because it's the only tooth where the mesial contact is more cervical than the distal. And I drew these yellow lines for you to see. On all your other teeth, the mesial contact is going to be higher toward the occlusal edge than the distal, right? On all the other teeth, it, like this one, it contacts here and it contacts down here. On all of them, that's the way they're going to go. They're going to slope toward the cervical. Where this one, it's the opposite. The distal is actually higher than the, the mesial. So that's another exception to that tooth. Most mandibular premolars taper narrower toward the lingual. And so you can see like this, it's wider at the buccal, it's narrower at the lingual. Except the three cusp type of mandibular second premolar where the lingual half may be wider than the buccal. So this is a picture of a mandibular second premolar. The lingual is wider than the buccal. Not always, but it can be. The rest of them, this all follows the rule. They're wider on the buccal than they are on the lingual. But because you're going to get that extra cusp down here, it's going to make the tooth wider. The lingual cusp of the mandibular first premolar is quite a bit shorter than the buccal. So I put the little stars to show you the cusps, and you can see on the mandibular first, the buccal cusp is much, much taller than the lingual. This is a very distinct looking tooth. You will have no problems recognizing this tooth because you can see the cusps. You can barely even see this cusp. You can see such a discrepancy between the height of those cusps versus the second premolar where they're almost equal. I think somebody got 
I'll have the meeting once. When the mandibular second premolar has two lingual cusps, the mesial lingual cusp is normally wider. So this is a picture of a second premolar with three cusps. This is a picture of a second molar with premolar with three cusps. There's the buccal cusp right here. And then this is the mesial lingual and this is the distal lingual cusps. See how much bigger that mesial lingual cusp is compared to the distal lingual. You will almost always see that will be noticeable. If you look from the occlusal, you can see the mesial lingual is bigger than the distal lingual. And they are separated by a lingual groove. A three cusp, write this down, a three cusp mandibular second premolar is the only one to have a lingual groove. A groove separates cusps. So if you have two cusps, something's got to separate them. It's sort of think of it like a mountain. You have two mountains, you've got to have a valley to separate them. Can you see that something. again? So your mandibular second premolar is the only premolar to have a lingual groove. The lingual groove separates the two lingual cusps. And so you can see in this picture on slide 28, there's a groove that separates these two cusps. Otherwise, they'd be just one big cusp. So we've got a division between the two of them. Can everybody see that OK? The mandibular first premolar is the only premolar and only posterior tooth to have its mesial marginal ridge more cervical than the distal. So if you look at this tooth, this is the lingual view, and you can see the mesial marginal ridge. Now remember on, on teeth that have occlusal tables, the marginal ridges are along the interproximals or between the teeth. Your cusp ridges come down on the basal and lingual, your marginal ridges are mesial and distal. And so you can see the mesial one is lower or more cervical than the distal one. the purple line or the green line. And then most mandibular first premolars have a mesial lingual groove separating the mesial marginal ridge from the mesial lingual cusp ridge. There's a little groove that comes down right here, and I don't know how well you can see that, but I've got the arrow pointing at it. There's a little groove right there. That is that groove, the mesial lingual groove, because it's on the mesial lingual part of the tooth, it's viewed from the lingual, you can see it from the lingual, is a distinct characteristic of that tooth. And that's the mandibul mandibular first premolar. It's got that little groove. For purposes of quizzes and tests, I will do the best to show that little groove when you're identifying a tooth. So if you look at this tooth down here, you can see the little groove right there. So look for that little groove. The other thing that it's characteristic for is this big, large buccal cusp and this tiny little lingual cusp. This tiny little lingual cusp is non-functional. It doesn't do anything. All your chewing of food happens with this big buccal cusp. The roots taper toward the apex, just like all the other teeth. They come down into like a cone shape. And the mesial lingual groove is often visible from the mesial too. So you can see it from the lingual and often from the mesial. The buccal height of contour is in the cervical third near the CEJ. So in other words, the tooth is the widest near the CEJ, like all teeth. We said earlier, all teeth, the buccal height of contour is in the cervical third. The lingual height of contour is in the middle. And you can see I marked the lingual height of contour is in the middle. And there is more CEJ curve on the mesial than the distal, like all premolars and all anterior teeth. And down here you can kind of see the CEJ arcs more on this view than it does on this view. The 
The mandibular first premolar has mesial and distal root depressions that are deeper on the distal. And the mandibular second premolar is likely to have a distal root depression, but not on the mesial. So the mandibular first premolar will have two, likely have two root depressions, one deeper on the distal, and the mandibular second premolar, distal root depression, but none on the mesial. So only one. These are pictures of the occlusal tables of the different types of premolars. You will see this on a quiz. You will probably, or not a quiz, on the midterm probably. You'll probably see this on the final. You will have to know these. This is a mandibular first premolar. This has got the huge buccal cusp. So the central groove, or this groove right here, is more toward the lingual. See, because the buccal cusp is so large, so if you looked at this table, you could see that this buccal cusp is so large and this little lingual, and you can see this groove that comes over the mesial lingual. Look for that groove if you're looking at this. You won't see it in this one or this one, only in this one. Can everybody see that little groove, I hope, right there? Characteristic of the mandibular first premolar. I'm going to jump over here to the far right. The mandibular second premolar with only two cusps has a buccal cusp. Sorry, I'm going to let somebody back in. Has a buccal cusp and a lingual cusp. Two cusps, buccal and lingual. And you can see how this central groove right here forms kind of a U-shaped. See that U-shape right there? This is a mandibular second premolar with three cusps. So you've got your buccal cusp right here. You've got your mesial lingual, which is your next largest cusp. And you've got your distal lingual. And you've got a groove, a lingual groove, that separates those two lingual cusps. So when you're taking, if you were looking at these occlusals on a quiz and I asked you to identify or a test and I asked you to identify which one is which, look for that little groove. This one has the large buccal cusp and the little mesial lingual groove right there. This one has, it's pretty rounded or square and it's got a lingual groove with three cusps. It's the only one that has the lingual groove. This one doesn't have any grooves coming off the occlusal. It's only got two cusps. And this is the shape that I was trying to, so the first has kind of a diamond shape. And if you look at this tooth, you can see it's got the large buccal cusp and the small lingual cusp. Forms almost like a diamond shape. This one's pretty round. And this one's, or square. These two are both the same. There should be a two cusp one. And then here on this, you've got the prominent transverse ridge um, that may separate the mesial and distal fossa with no central groove. So this is your mandibular first premolar. You've got your little mesial lingual groove right here. You've got a very prominent transverse ridge. So you're going to come down from here and up that little lingual one. On your two cusp second premolar, same thing. You've got a transverse, transverse ridge that runs from the buccal down up the mes or up the lingual, like the skateboarding ramp. But on the three cusp, you don't have that because the cusps are separated. So you can't slide right down because the cusps form a Y. So these are your two cusp second premolars. They can have different occlusal tables. The groove pattern is either an H or a U. 
So the write this down. The two cusp mandibular second premolars can have an H or a U shape. And if you look here, here's the central groove forming a U. Here's the buccal cusp. Here's the lingual cusp. So two cusps. This is a transverse ridge right here. Or you can have it form an H where it has extra grooves and it forms an H. Again, you still have your buccal cusp, you still have your lingual cusp, and you have a transverse ridge right here. But it forms an H because you've got extra grooves. This one doesn't have those grooves. You can have either one. There's no like one's not more common. There no, there's no like rhyme or reason to it. But notice there's no lingual groove. Neither of them have a lingual group because they only have one lingual cusp. On this picture, you've got three cusps, a buccal, a mesial lingual, and a distal lingual. The mesial lingual is the second largest next to the buccal, which is the biggest. And there's your lingual groove separating your cusps. And you'll notice these pinkish colored lines. That's your triangular ridges. They don't meet up with each other. So they don't form a transverse ridge. They form a Y pattern. So if you, um, I'm sorry, didn't mean to do that. The central groove um, may be called mesial and distal grooves joining at the central pit. So here's the Y pattern. So you've got your mesial groove right here. You've got your distal groove and your lingual groove and they form a Y. Can everybody see that? So you can only have a Y pattern on a three cusp mandibular second premolar. Hence the Y pattern. And this is a picture that illustrates some of that. You can see here's the U, here's the H, and here's the Y. These are real teeth. Now it's important when you're looking at a second premolar that you know whether it's got two cusps or three. And the reason it's kind of important is if you were to do a sealant on it, you would want to make sure you sealed all of the grooves. Dentists need to know that if they're doing a restoration. So you want to make sure you seal all of them. Or restore all of them in, the, in that case. Does anybody have any questions? So in this slide, the um, tooth the farthest left, is that a first? Premolar, or is that a second? It's a second. And that's the U. And it's forming a U. So I'm talking about, I'm sorry, above that. Which one here? Yeah. This one up here. The farthest so, left. Yes, farthest that. Left. No, this is a first. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. And it doesn't have, you can see it doesn't have anything marked on it. This yeah. is the U right here. Right. Okay. And this is the H. And then this is the. Y pattern. OK, just checking. Thank you. So these both have only two cusps, a buckle and a lingual. And then this one has three cusps. So th this is kind of a, something to really pay attention to. Um, I know it's something that boards likes and you'll have it again when you get there. As far as, um, let me see, as far as studying, let me look at Canvas. Let me stop recording first. And stop screen sharing. Okay, so as far as studying goes, um, I posted a couple of things for you 